Next on Rugby Wrap-Up, a Major League Rugby recap and preview with Steve Lewis, Alex Corbicero, Brian Ray, and Matt McCarthy. Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by The Pig and Whistle, the world's best rugby pub. The Murphy Kennedy Group, founded with the idea that construction can be done better. And Lean and Limber, stretching your way to a healthier lifestyle. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, Rugby Wrap-Up. Thanks again for joining us, Matt McCarthy, with Mr. Alex Corbacero, Stephen Lewis, and Brian Ray. And we're talking Major League Rugby. We didn't think it was going to happen, or at least I didn't think it was going to happen. The impossible happened. Major League Rugby, in its infancy, on the heels of a pandemic, got a weekend in with, with all the teams. But the order shifted in the matches. And why don't we recap the matches and start with... Steve, your Rugby United New York in Las Vegas against the home team, the San Diego Legion. Yeah, so I think first you've made the point, right? Everyone is delighted, sort of um, coaches, players, backroom staff, just to get there and play a game of rugby. And it was funny because, you know, the week before, everyone was like, let's just get there, let's get through it, blah, blah, blah. Once we were there and we knew we were playing, it was all about, I want to win, I want to win, I want to win. It got all competitive again, you know, but that that's great. That's what sport's about. As far as the game, horrific win. Gale force conditions, blowing sort of diagonally across the field, made passing difficult, made kicking a lottery, um, changed the game a wee bit. And that added to the sort of, you know, 15 months out of rugby, everyone's nervous, referees, players, coaches. Uh, it was a pretty entertaining game, right? Back and forth, lots of lead changes. Terrific win for New York and came out with a win on the road against a pretty good team. So we're very happy. I thought it was a really competitive game. I think, um, you know, credit to both teams for having very minimal preparation and, and to be able to go out there in those wins and those conditions and play. I, I thought it was, you know, fun watching, competitive. Um, you could see both teams, uh, you know, are, are a little rusty, but I, but I thought the physicality that New York bring uh, to be able to handle those ball carriers of, of San Diego and, and, you know, San Diego's game plan was working for a while, but in the second half, it was, you know, them who have fallen off tackles, which I don't think in the MLR we're used to seeing. Um, it's the most points San Diego have actually, I think, conceded in the MLR um, and or their biggest loss in recent times. And, and for me, if you actually looked at some of the key stats of that game, you know, New York were actually on the wrong end in some. You know, they had a higher penalty count. They had, you know, a lot of different things against them. But I thought it was their ability in the second half to their backup set piece took control of the game. They were the ones on the front foot in the carries. And it was San Diego falling off the tackles at the end. And and they stole the day. And I I think credit to them and just credit in general that we got this first weekend off the ground and and were able to watch, you know, competitive rugby out there. You know, I thought New York was just more fit I just think Dylan Fawcett summarized it best when he said we just showed grit. You know, two yellow cards to key positions. Rashford I agreed. They, they they had twenty minutes with with a man down in the game, and and I thought Andy Ellis was fantastic for them. The control of the game. I thought Osberger started very well for San Diego and was bossing bossing things. But then as the game went on, I thought Ellis really came in his own. That little shoulder ball was class. A few quick touches, just savvy betting out there. That you know, especially as his pack got on the got on the winning side of exchanges. I think, you know, the, the scrum started to go New York's way. Their mall was really doing some damage for them. Or, like when you've got an, an experienced halfback as well uh, and, and he gets that armchair ride from the pack and you've got an all-black sort of caliber, you know, that showed in the game to me as well. Yeah, I, I thought Augsburger had a great game on both sides of the ball. So did I. Yeah, and, and you know, you had some great pinch hit performances from Rooney or Rugby United New York. You had uh, Wilton Ribello coming in off the bench and he was great. And I thought Ben Foden really showed his class when they needed it most, when they were down a man coming out of the half, Brian, what was your thought on this game? Yeah. I thought the first 20 minutes, both tie, both teams were kind of uh, blowing a bit because of the pace, you know, it's, first game in a while for a lot of these guys, but they, you know, kind of settled into it, notwithstanding the win. My favorite uh, moment of the match was when Dan Holland's head shanked that conversion from almost in front and the wonderful commentator uh, thankfully pointed out that not all gimmies are gimmies. So please, can we get the conversions back in the damn game? And a lot of points and a lot of points scored in all the matches, pretty much. The next one up was the Giltinis christening their, their stadium which was massive, but looked great on camera. 42-27 over the Free Jacks, Stephen. Yeah, well, historic game for LA. Obviously, they're first in the comp. Coliseum Stadium looked great. 
a predictable win, I felt, you know, given given um, the star power. Given the star power, you know, they're all, they're going to put points up this year. The interesting thing, I think, for LA will be will be when they get in tight games and they have to go to the bench. I mean, their starting lineup, you know, they, they've got that 12 foreign roster spots. They've got some great players there. But then if they start those 12, how deep do those 12 go? And what's the bench look like? That, that, that might be LA's Achilles heel going forward. But obviously, given the talent they have they're going to, and their scrum coach, they're going to be heavily favored. Alex, what's your assessment of the front row play on both teams? I, th I thought it was a decent battle. I, I thought that, um, you know, the Free Jacks, you know, gnarly experienced pack. Um, and, you know, it, it was a bit of back and forth. I thought in the second half, I, I thought the Guiltini started to, you know, to actually assert some dominance, where in the first half, it was pretty even and could have gone either way. Um, you know, with the scrum laws now, there's, there's a lot of, you know, premise on being accurate on your setup and your drill. And I think everyone's adjusting to that a little bit and um you know still a long way to go i think for both packs but I, I was pretty happy for a first hit out from from an la point of view i think there was a lot of errors out there a lot of turnover so in, in a different day that game could have lo looked a lot different and also playing the free jacks when you had no tape on them no not really too sure what to expect with a new coach and and some changes like it, it was a good first hit out for both teams. And I actually think the Free Jacks handled themselves pretty well in that game. I saw a lot of promise where they're going to build into this season and be a handful for teams. And, and I just thought probably, you know, really the difference is, was, was the halfbacks, you know, the nine and 10 and the Guiltinis and being able to play that sort of wide, uh, you know, you know, wide, wide game plan and use the full width of the pitch just, just probably was the difference as well as, you know, bit of physicality at certain times as well. So there was no hangover from the preseason for the Guiltinis. No comments necessary. Brian, what did you think of that match? Yeah, just to build on what Alex said there about the youth and the uh, the Free Jacks. I mean, experienced players they had out there. Uh, Justin Johnson, number eight, first ever game as a pro. Harrison Boyle, he's played a few minutes for Otago before this. So, you know, young, inexperienced guys, they'll get better. Uh, you can see they're a well-coached side. They had a couple of really nice set moves for tries I was impressed with. Uh, and, and look, the Free Jacks had... Uh, you know, how many minutes did they play down to 14? They had two yellow cards, so they were down to 13 at one point. They had a red card to John Pullen, unfortunate, their scrum half. So, and they fought back. Hey, they were down, what, uh, 14 nothing within eight minutes. DTH already has a couple tries, something like that. So they they, cut, they came back. It was 21-17 at one point. Uh, so, you know, they can feel okay about themselves. But, yeah, those the Giltinis have some firepower. A couple of those passing sequences, you just said, whew, that looked a little bit too easy out there. You know, the one thing that I took away from the from the match is that you've got these star players, but the the opponents playing against them get to, to get to experience that level of play, and it's just going to make them better. And you play up like yourself, at, you know, in New York Sevens at Randall's when you're playing the fire department B side. You know, you're playing when they're playing against me, they pick up their level a little, little bit. Playing guys better than yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the all time leading ground gainer for the New York Rugby Club. Google it. Next match up. We didn't see this one coming. None of us saw this one coming. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Toronto Arrows beating the... Oh, no. They lost to Rugby ATL. Brian, why don't you start with this one? 21-14. Well, you can see... Explain it. You got a lot of explaining to do, Lucy. Yeah, ATL, uh, credit to them. That's why I've got this lovely background here. You can't really see this in the shirt, but it's kind of a snaky, scaly thing. You're a good... <laughs> no, ATL, full credit. Uh, they played really well in defense in that game. They got stuck in. Uh, arrows were sloppy. They got uh, a little bit anxious a couple times close to the goal line. Got called back for a couple double movements. Uh, red card, unfortunate to Gaston Cortez in the second half, which everybody missed because the camera crew was asleep. Uh, not helpful, but uh, anyways, so that explains why they were uh, not able to get over the line at the end to get a tie. But no, uh, full respect to ATL, not only for hosting the Arrows, but playing a great match, playing great defense and, and getting the win. Just a, a gutsy performance from them. I think the defense was was the difference between the two teams. Um, I, I thought that, you know, the line speed, the pressure that Atlanta went to put on, um, you know, kept them in the game at times and, and then won the game for them. And I think you know, at a time when, you know, you only have a minimal time of preparation, there's only so many areas you can really put your, you know, your cards in. And, and defense sometimes is the quickest one, but it, but it also... There's lots of other areas of the field that you have to address. So the fact that they've got their defense up and running, I know last year they were quite impressive with some of the line speed as well. So I think that continuity uh, really helped them that they, it's hard to be a, 
a, an aggressive defensive team in a short amount of time because it, it can create a lot of opportunities for teams to pick you off. Well said. Guys, wait a minute. We got to take a quick break. We're going to pause the recap and come back. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. I've been blind since I was four, and I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label. None of that stuff influences me. I drink beer because of the taste, and my beer is Pabst Blue Ribbon. It has a taste and the flavor. What do you think's on the label? I think there's a, a naked woman riding on a unicorn, jumping over fire. Oh, that's good beer. And we are back, continuing our recap with Mr. Alex Corbusero, Steve Lewis, and Brian Ray. And then there was the Sabercats beating the Seawolves, another one that I didn't see happening, 30-24. to 24. Steve, what's your takeaway from this one? Yeah, definitely another upset, right? Seattle defending champions, uh, as it were. I know Brian doesn't like well, that. Well, are you the, the still the two-time yeah. USA Rugby Coach of the Year? I am Don't indeed. do that when, you talk, when you're saying that about yourself, do you? Ad infinitum. Um, but yeah, definitely an upset. Seattle... You know, um, I, don't, I don't know what's what's going on up there. See my injury, I think some uh, damage may talk to later. It was obviously a factor, but that's a great win for Houston. They've been in the doldrums a little bit, a relatively nothing preseason, no big signings. So great for them to get the season off uh, with a win like that. You know, for our, our new American fans, the, lo- the loss of SEMA in that game is the equivalent of losing like Drew Brees if Drew Brees also kicks field goals and extra points and tackles. So it's a key, key component there. Brian, what was your takeaway? Yeah, I mean, you can talk about Seaman in that game, but the thing I want to point out for Houston is they're missing both their captains, Devette Roos and Luke Beecham. They've also got at least three, if not four, uh, new signings on the way, so they're going to be a stronger team. That's a third of their starting lineup missing from that game, and they really fronted up some big hits, for particularly uh, Dickie Dickie Laddie, my favorite player, uh, the Fijian, laying in some thunderous tackles out there. He's just a human highlight reel. Uh, I, I love that. The, I have to point out, by the way, that I picked this win last week. Uh, uh, against all odds. So uh, well done, Houston. I, I was impressed with, with, with the Houston's fight in that game. I thought the Seattle started quite well, uh, tried to, you know, to, to, to attack wide early. And, you know, with, with Seema there, they have a pretty strong kicking game as well. And, and with his loss, it definitely interrupted the game. Suniola came in, took the ball to the line well, you know, still did the thing. But when you've been preparing and only had so much time to prepare and then you lose your 10 that early, it's definitely going to throw a spanner in the works. And then, I just thought that the dog in Houston and the forwards to sort of take it to them at the end of the game, you know, some big scrums, a couple of big driving malls um, that, you know, at the end of the game, I think, you know, it's all about momentum and, and those things can really shift the game. Similar to thought how they shifted the Rooney game at the end. And then I thought Houston, you know, did well to, to score a couple of cheeky tries, you know, from opportunistic moments that at the same time. So for me, it was a, it was, a, it was an exciting game because it was close and back and forth and, you know, Houston, I picked Houston to win before that game just because I, I felt like they had the pack. And, uh, you know, I, and I just, I don't know, I just had a feeling about them in that game. But Seattle were actually the team that started better. Here's two things that I took away from that. Matt Turner is supposed to be an assistant coach. He was all over the pitch, including doing kicking and a kick, a conversion kick from the corner. Like, it was no big deal. And like a 50-yard run up the gut, right? So that's one thing. And I have rumors, I have good intelligence that say – a USA rugby legend is coming out of retirement. Alex, who might this be to join Seattle? Samu Manoa is rejoining the Seattle Seawolves. You heard it here on Rugby Wrap Up. And I also have sources that tell me there's a Japanese import in the back line coming in. So mm-hmm. tune in to Rugby Wrap Up for more gossip. Next one up, we got the Utah Warriors. Another one that I got wrong. Beating the other drink. The Gilgronis, 30 to 28. Yeah, Akahito Yamada is going to look good in a Seattle jersey. Uh, where were we talking about Austin and Utah? Uh, that one caught me by surprise, too. I, I really liked what I saw from Austin in the preseason. But, hey, uh, Utah played really well. Um, and, hey, how many yellow cards? Three yellow cards they put up with that game. So they played fifty or 30 minutes of that match down to 14. Uh, a lot of mistakes by Austin in that one. 
Uh, they just they look flat. They didn't look like uh, the team I was expecting to see out there. They also had quite a few injuries in that match. By the end, they had Bryce Campbell playing flanker. Um, but you got to credit to Utah. They played well. I thought Yuri Van Voor in the number eight had a great match, aside from that, you know, unfortunate yellow at the end. But uh, he was storming all over the place. Lance Williams scored an awesome try in the corner. Great to see him back. So, uh, you know, good performance from Utah. I, I have to take my hat off to them. They, they earned that victory. And Alex, your boys up front, McClellan and Malolo, the hooker, had a, had a great match for Utah. Definitely. I thought the pressure they put on up front was good. And, and the try from Malolo was, was impressive and, and, and good to see front row scoring. And I, you know, I didn't think I, after we, LA played Austin the week before, I, I, was at, I, I was expecting Austin to potentially win that game. I saw a lot of potential in, 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 in the way they were playing. And, and, I, and I do think, you know, you've got to credit Utah there. They just took control of the game and, and Austin never quite got out of, out of first gear. Yeah, I would agree with Brian's uh, earlier comments. You know, no one really saw it coming. Austin had looked like they uh, had a good preseason. And as Alex said, I was kind of expecting more. I thought this would be a comfortable home win. So credit to Utah going on the road and uh, getting some points. And then finally, NOLA and Old Glory, 26-26 tie, Vegas in an uproar. But I would imagine... That old Glory's pretty happy about getting out of Dodge with a tie after their only loss last year was a one-sided affair to the gold, Alex. Yeah, I thought it was a, a, a good game, and it, it was one of those ones that could have gone either way. Uh, I, I thought Nola were, were going to get it done off the back of that win last year, and just you know they, they looked quite good in preseason. They had a lot of time together in continuity, and and I think that favoured them. But some of the some of the attacking play from from Old Glory, you you can't sleep on them. That that try at the end down the short side was naughty, and and I I do think that's their X factor. They they have a, you know, a fast back line that can move that ball well off turnover or, or, or find a space on the edge and and that sort of kept them in the game brian if you're gonna dye your hair platinum blonde you're gonna stand out and you better be good tusi tala baby come on yeah i think my uh, platinum days are long gone there matt sorry but uh no tusi tala looked awesome robertson uh, that that combination we talked about them last year they were on fire in this game uh i i have to say old glory took advantage of every scoring opportunity they had Spilled pass, uh, you know, Mikey. So Senny Fay, a guy picks it up, passes it to Tusi Tala, races in for that seven point try. Uh, whereas Nola, every time they had a shot of points, they took the scrum. They really wanted to score tries. And, uh, you know, these new scrum laws definitely did not help them, but they also made mistakes themselves. So for me, they dominated possession. They uh, they dominated field position. They didn't take advantage of that scoring. Lots of forced passes that just uh, didn't come off. Uh, if I'm Nola, I'm really disappointed with that result. They should have won that game. Uh, but no, credit credit to Old Glory. I mean, uh, they like I said, they took every opportunity in that one and some great defense. Jamison uh, Fatanana Schultz, two huge turnovers. Mike Daboulis, try saving tackle and turnover. So uh, credit to them for playing tough defense. To Satala and Robertson, the halfbacks for uh, DC are a useful combo. Um, but I think the other interesting player there is Callum Gibbons, right, who's come in from Glasgow. He's a bit hard-nosed. He, he knows his way around. He's a competitor. He might actually be even a bigger influence as the season goes on. So we're going to come back with a quick preview of the upcoming matches right after this. We are back. It's time for our MLR preview. Guys, first one up. New York goes to NOLA. I think this is a tough battle. I think the forwards will probably decide this game of who can get the edge there. I think they've both got strong packs that they use as a, as a platform for, for, for how they want to play in this game. So I think, for me, that battle is huge. Uh, I'm probably... Because it's home for Nola, I'm, I'm going to favor Nola just, but but I, I'm, I'm pick Nola. But it, this one's a toss up to me. I'm a little bit disappointed in Nola's performance this past week and also a little bit of a short turnaround for them. So because of that, I'm going to give the edge to New York. First three games on the road, you know, so do your percentages. We're in reasonable shape if we come out with three games, two wins, 11 points, more than happy. ATL Old Glory, Old Glory with their home opener. Yeah, cracking match, uh, the contest between these two last year. So I'm very much looking forward to this. I think Old Glory is going to be really fired up at home in their new venue, Segra Field. But uh, hey, I am repping ATL this week. So uh, 
I'm going with the visitors. The Rattlers picking up the win on the road. I think it's an exciting matchup. I think you've got quite a potent attack versus an aggressive defense. And, and I think that, you know, sets up a good contest. For me, I think Old Glory get it done at home. I think the occasion, the moment, uh, the flashes I saw from them last week, uh, I, I think you've got to favor them this weekend. We've got the Free Jacks going into Houston. I, uh, I mentioned uh, Fortress Aviva. I'm going to stick with that. I think Houston at home uh, is a good place for them. Free Jacks, I'd be a little bit concerned if uh, John Poland's going to miss this with suspension because of that record. I don't know that for sure, but I suspect so. That's a bit of a blow for them. So I'm going with the Sabercats. Uh, again, another one I think could go either way. I think you know a lot of these matches are very competitive. I'm going to favor... Houston because they're at home and they've just had a bit more time together and games under their belt. So I think, I think their pack and some of that area will probably be enough to get them through, especially if they have a Devet Roos back as well. I'm going with the free Jacks. I think, I think they're going to rebound. I think they're going to get it done. Next one up. The Utah Warriors hosting the Toronto Arrows, Brian. I got to stick with my arrows. Uh, they're going to front up even without Cortez at the scrum. So Arrows over Utah in a close one. Yeah, I, I still think Toronto are going to pull it out. If you'd asked me the opening round, my thoughts, I would have said Toronto. Now I'm very much on the fence because I think Utah impressed me in their first game. And I think the fact they're at home and they've had more time to prep and, and actually are a fitter side than a lot of these other sides coming in just because of continuity they've had in their preparations. Um, I'm going to go Utah. I'm, I'm going with the Arrows. Okay, then we've got the Gil Gronies hosting the Legion. I, I think this is a, a, a mouth-watering, tantalizing uh, matchup. So I'm just, I'm looking forward to it. It just makes you thirsty, right? The Gilgronis? I think the San Diego Legion bounce back. Um, I think they, they have had very little time uh, to prep for this. I think before this game, they'd only had a 20-minute scrimmage against Seattle. So I think, you know, them dropping off in the second half of some of those tackles was really the difference maker. If they go out and play how they did on the weekend and improve in a few areas and they don't drop, have that drop off in defense, which I think they would have learned a lot from, from getting their first game under their belt. I, I'm favoring San Diego to bounce back. I, I think so too. I think if they find a way to get some of those big bodies, the ball in the open field, like Mahoney and Nazagenge and Wuching and Tamalo, they can just utilize that and pound those guys all day. I thought they were going to do that early against New York and they got away from that. Yeah. You know, I'd like to pick Austin at home. Uh, but the thing that concerns me is they've got some early uh, season injury problems. Uh, they had Michael Duvall, the flanker playing second row, the whole second half at that game on the, this past weekend. And they were, you know, like I said, Campbell was on the flank at the end. So uh, they got some hurting bodies up front. I think that doesn't help them. I think San Diego's going to uh, be revved up. They don't want to go. zero and two. So I'm going to have to go with the Legion in this one. Last one. The Giltinis, again at the Coliseum, hosting the Seawolves. And this is not what you want to be going into if you're the Seawolves in the search, in search of a win, Alex. Because it's your team. It, yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a good matchup. I, 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 think, I, I think just honestly, even though I'm affiliated with the Giltinis, I'm going to favor them going in. I think they showed more in the first game than Seattle did. And I think, you know, the fitness and and... The, the emphasis on maybe moving that team around uh, will be too much for them. I tell you what, if you're a Seawolves fan, you got to be nervous right now uh, on the road for the first, what, five weeks of the season and going into this game against the Giltinis, who look pretty good. Uh, yeah, uh, you got to go with LA in this one. And uh, man, Seattle's going to be uh, hurting, I think, after this. Yeah, you got to go with a Galacticos, right? You got to go with Los Angeles here. No question. And as John Bradshaw Layfield said on our sports betting show, which we will also be presenting this week again, you got to follow the money. And Alex, I think LA's got a lot of money to follow. <laughs> Any comments? None whatsoever, mate. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, you have been kind and gracious, and I think we're done with our recap and preview Major League Rugby 2021 Week 2. Very exciting to see it coming up. Uh, final thoughts on anything MLR related that is on your head. Yeah, so just uh, as, it's such a joyous thing having all six games no kick off. The proof point. of the pudding is going to come midweek, though, right? When uh, everyone's got home, everyone goes through their first round of post-match COVID tests. So fingers crossed, everyone's uh, behaved, everyone's done the right thing. I think they have. And uh, if we move on to a full second uh, 
second week, that will be a fantastic statement for the league. I have to say uh, the Rugby Network, well done. Great to have uh, that this year. If I can make uh, one request, sorry, two heading into this weekend, please show us the cards that are shown and please show us the conversions that are left in the damn game. Thank you. Just like you're expecting the production to keep improving, I I think so with the rugby too. I think, you know, we got the first hit out, but I'm just expecting teams and the caliber of rugby that's played in this league to grow week on week. If you had more time, more reps as a team, more games and more time to actually work on things as a a playing group. So so I'm quite excited for for where the standard of rugby is going to end up, you know, a few weeks into the season. I'm just wondering if San Diego is going to remain in Las Vegas because it was so windy out there. I got I got wind burn, and I was in Austin, just calling the game. You know? Listen, ex- Exeter have won multiple championships after building a style of play with facing a, a vicious wind at their home ground. So if they are there for the season, which you know selfishly I hope they're not, just because I it would be nice to have a camera view that's a little higher, and obviously the wind impacted the quality of the rugby. I think as well but yeah 100 percent. and on that note we are out of time so on behalf of mr alexander the great corbacero check out his the american rugby show mr stephen the lizard lewis and brian america's rugby news ray i'm matt mccarthy signing off and please check out our other segments including our major league rugby show Our global rugby recap. What are the odds? Our Major League Rugby Sports Bet Show with the Philly Godfather, John Bradshaw Layfield, the WWE legend, and Gifty Beilu. Martial Law, the Zack Attack. And please sign up for our American Red Cross Rugby Wrap-Up Blood Donor Team.